hard to believe, I think. Um, anyway, just a couple quick announcements. Your homework nine is due on Monday. I have your finally. I have your homework seven. Sorry for the delay. I have that to give back to you guys this morning. Um, I will have your homework homework eights back to you uh, to return on Monday. Um, but if you want to, I, I will not be returning your homework nines obviously before the before the final exam. So if you want if you want that homework nine to study from or whatever, I would make a copy of that. Um, and later this morning, I'm going to post some final exam review activities, which we will uh, go over on on Monday. Um, I think you guys can kind of know what to expect for the final exam. There's going to be there's going to be a regression problem on there. There's going to be hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. Otherwise, so um, all the stuff that we've been doing in the last few chapters here is what is exactly what you can expect to see. And so those exam review activities will give you some heads up on that, I guess. Um, any questions or comments before we get started today? Yeah. Pete. Are you going to post solutions to homework nine? Yes, absolutely. I will post solution to homework nine. Um, yeah, same same time as usual, right after class on on Monday. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, so then today we're going to get through as much as possible of this of this section of notes. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit. I, I thought I would maybe have two days to go over this, and here we only have one, so um, it's going to have to be a few things cut out of this. But um, I think uh, so. In this section, we sort of present some interesting extensions to the regression stuff that we saw on in the previous chapter, and this is uh, I think where the regression stuff really starts to get interesting. And I, I at least want to expose you guys to this so that if and when you see it later, you'll have a some uh, some understanding of what that is. Um, has anybody done multiple regression or anything like this before? Is this have you done some of this before? Okay, nice. Um, anybody else in their intro or other stat classes done any of this? No. Okay. Well, the yeah. just just on a tangent, is this material that will be on the final? Oh, exactly. So this will not. This material will not be on the final exam. Yeah. So we're going to kind of burn through it. But uh, and I, I'm also going to post. Speaking of that, I'm going to post comp sort of the filled in version of this notes just for you guys to have since we won't get to everything. Uh, but yeah, this, this will not be on the final exam. Um, but uh, yeah, so the extensions are all exactly what you'd expect. Um, and so it's, it's not too crazy, but um, let's take a look at what we got here. OK, so just remembering chapter, chapter 12, simple linear regression, uh, we had our model looked something like this. Uh, we had our explanatory, our predictor, or our, our response variable, y, is a linear function of our explanatory variable. So beta 0 plus beta 1x plus an error term where we're assuming we have normal errors. Um, so here we have one response variable y and one explanatory or predictor variable x. Um, and so uh, it's a good place to start, uh, get an idea of the, how to do inference and all that stuff. But um, I would argue it's not all that interesting. You know, you can look at a scatter plot and kind of know the whole story without even <laughs> running the regression. Um, but that's that's where we kind of needed to start. But but anyway, the goal the goal here in multiple regression, what we're talking about here, is that we're going to do the same thing. We're going to build a, a linear model, um, but now we're going to have more than one predictor variable that we can throw into this thing. Um, <clears throat> so we still just have one response variable y, but now we have uh, more than one, and so we'll we'll say we have k of them, x1, x2, up to xk, different explanatory variables or different predictor variables. Um, and our model is going to look very similar, right? So before it was just um, before it was just this first chunk plus the error, <clears throat> right? Beta zero plus beta one x, uh, beta one x one, um, and now we're going to possibly throw in more more predictor variables there, um, as this is sort of a more interesting more interesting case here. But we're still going to assume our errors have this normal distribution, so we the inference is sort of all has the same same foundation as before. So, so just as an example, um, you could think back in chapter 12, if we were trying to predict the selling price of a house, we could have done a, linear, a simple linear regression model on the, the price of the house on any, any one of these things. We could have looked at size um, of the house, age of the house, or maybe the number of rooms that are in that house. All those things you can imagine having a, um, having a relationship with how, how much the, the house sells for. Um, so we could have done individual models there, but um, now what we can do is put all of these into a single model and use uh, the relationship with all of the explanatory variables to go about predicting the 
um, predicting the response variable, which here is our the selling price of a house. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're going to get to an example later, but if you remember that the Cleveland Cavs example we did right at the end of class on Wednesday, we were trying to predict the number of wins that the Cavs would have based on uh, what three point percentage, and then we did a second one on turnovers. So we could put both of those into the same model, but what else would you think might have a, an impact on the number of wins that the Cleveland Cavs would have in a season? What other explanatory variables? Free throw percentage, absolutely, yeah. No, any other? What else would make a? What else makes a good basketball team? <laughs> yeah, maybe how many fouls there are. Uh, how what their what their field goal percentage shooting uh, shooting is. How many steals they have, turnovers. You know, all the, all these things could go into a could go into a single model we could use. Um, to predict the number of wins, and so that's that's the final example that I hope we have time to get to today. Um, but the point is, there could be there could be um, many explanatory variables that have an interesting relationship with the response variable, and here we want to um, figure out how we can can do the same the same formulation here. Uh, so the interpretation of our model parameters stays stays very similar. So um, looking at that that general additive multiple regression model that's just above this, um, the interpretation for beta 1, for example, is uh, is sort of the same as what we've seen before. So um, beta 1 here uh, represents the expected change um, in our response variable y when its corresponding predictor, so when x1 increases by one unit. Okay, so that's the same that's the same interpretation as it was before us. It's like the slope in that direction. It's just the change in y when you increase x by one unit. Um, but the thing to tack on here now is that um, this is true when when all the other um, predictor variables So that's x2, x3, all the way up to xk, uh, stay the same. So if you keep everything else the same and increase x1 by one unit, that's uh, beta 1 is your expected change in y there. So the, the interpretations are almost exactly the same, but just tacking on the caveat that everything else needs to be held, held the same. So you, you could write the same interpretation for all the other parameters. Okay, so the goals the goals that we're going to have here are, are the same as what we've as what we had before. So we want to um, the same as what we did in simple linear regression. We still want to estimate our model parameters, all the betas, beta one up to beta k. Uh, we want to estimate our error variance. That's our other parameter in the model. Uh, we want to do inference on the model parameters. So um, we want to do confidence intervals and tests for those beta parameters, maybe. Um, we want to do ANOVA, so this is the analysis of variance, um, or the F test, sort of the model utility test that we've seen before. Um, and again, we could do inference for our estimated or predicted Y values. But there's sort of this extra extra thing that we have to do, um, which is we need to choose choose what the model is going to be. Um, in other words, we need to choose which predictor variables are going to go into that model. Um, and so this kind of gets at the idea of uh, modeling is, is sort, of, sort of an art form in that you have to sort of know, um, it's sort of based on experience you can sort of learn how to shape your model to, to be something that's going to be, so going to be useful. Um, so we also need to figure out which, which predictor variables we're going to put into this to our model. Um, so I'm going to skip over a little bit of this next section to, to get on, but, be, but uh, what I do want to say is that um, there even if you only have a few predictor variables that you think might be interesting, um, there's still lots and lots of different models that you could that you could choose here. Um, so let's starting out with we just have uh, two predictor variables. Uh, we're trying to um, predict or estimate our response y based on x1 and x2, whatever those might be. Um, 
So one, one possible model is just the simple one where we just have uh, beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus our error. Um, that, that might be a fine model. But we can also uh, we can, we can add things into this model by creating new predictor variables, which are functions of x1 and or x2. Um, so for example, you could create a new predictor variable x3 that is x1 squared. Um, and you could create a new predictor variable x4 that's the product of x1 and x2. Um, and so then if so then you could throw those into your model and it has the same general form as we've as was listed above. Um, so so the, the point is that this kind of gets back to that idea of you, has, you still have to choose what your model is going to be um, even for whatever predictor variables you think might be interesting. interesting there's other combinations of those um, predictors that might result in a better model. And just so there are there are many possible choices. So this kind of gets at the the um, choice of the model is, is a big part of uh, is a big part of the analysis. Um, so just to just to give you in general um, some general classes of models that we that we that you might see or, or um, might think about fitting are are these four. We have our first order and our second order models, which correspond to um, sort of the largest the largest power that we have in a predictor variable. So the first order we just have um, our predictors to the first power. In our second order we have uh, we can we square we square our predictor variables um, and then we can also add an interaction term here. So we can um, add in um, products of our explanatory variables. Um, and you can also do that combine both of those things together. Um, so again how, how do you, yes sir? Ah, great question. So do these de deviate from being linear at all? Um, yes and no. So, so technically yes, right? If I, if I use model number two there and I have squared um, predictive variables, then, my, then your, 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 uh, the, the function that you're setting up is now a quadratic function, right? Um, we, will, we will continue to call it a uh, a linear model because there's still because we're adding adding up the the different terms in here so we're not we're not multiplying we're not multiplying the whole thing together our, our parameters are still something plus something plus something um, so even though yeah even though you have quadratic terms or, or could be anything in there really I uh, will still call this a linear model for that reason that's a great question <clears throat> yeah Okay, so, th so these are just some sort of some sort of general classes that you could that you could think about expanding for if you had if you had more variables in here as well. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to um, flip over one page to the estimating parameters section. I'm going to jump ahead and, and we'll come back to the this middle section if we if we get a chance to. So this is now page three five page five of the of the notes that I that I've given you there. The section on estimating parameters. Um, so yeah, so we have we have all these choices for for what what model what model we can fit or uh, what model we can choose. Um, so the the question might be so how do I know which model to choose? How do I know which model is going to be good or useful? And uh, that's kind of kind of what we'll talk about now. That's kind of goes into this estimation and doing inference on on our parameters and on unknown models. Okay. So in our in our general case, if we have k predictor variables, and again, um, some of those could be functions of the other predictor, vari predictor variables, whatever. Um, so now we're going to have our observed data is now going to consist of uh, multivariate observations. So um, on our first individual, we're going to have the response y1, but then also all k of our predictor variables. So we'll start doubling up the subscript there. So um, and we'll have that for each of our. Uh, each of our n individuals, uh, we have now um, the response as well as as well as k k uh, variables that we have on each of those um, each of those observations. And uh, how we're going to go about estimating the parameters is the same as we did before. We're going to do this principle of least squares, um, where we're going to find the values of our parameters that minimize um, the squared deviations. So uh, before we we minimized to actually estimate what our parameters are, we minimize the sum of the y i minus beta zero plus beta one 
xi. So we minimize that, and now, now we're just extending that. So now our model has more than two, um, two coefficients in it, and so we're having now all k of those things, and we want to minimize this squared distance. Um, and the, again, the values that minimize this sum are going to be our, are going to be our parameter estimates. Um, and there's, there's a funny line in your textbook that says something like, uh, it's really complicated or something, and we'll use, we'll use technology to find these values. And then, then that's what we'll do. Um, in general, how many of you guys have taken linear algebra or any, any matrix algebra class? Okay, so there are, there are ways to formulate these things in terms of matrices, and then you can sort of algebraically solve for what, these, uh, what the form of these estimates are. Um, we won't worry about that for now. We'll, we'll sort of fall back onto technology to, um, to do our estimates here. Um, so again, again here we're going to be looking at technology. We're going to be looking at jump output, for example, and using that to uh, figure out what our what our model is. Yeah, Kevin. If this is a general model, is this something that would be considered to take a lot of time to figure out which would be the best fit, or is that like secondary to something else? So if this is if this is a if there are lots of different models, um, does it take a lot of time to figure out which one would be the good fit? Uh, yeah, it absolutely can. Um, so actually, actually estimating the model doesn't take very long. That's computationally that's very fast. Um, but again, yeah, it, the the point is there are lots of different possible models you can choose, and to sort of check each one of those and compare them, um, that can be a very long. Yeah, it can take a very long time because there are so many there are so many possibilities choices that you that you have. Definitely. Okay. Well, let's look at a let's look at a quick example here. This is a out of your textbook. So, in uh, this solid state technology journal, um, they describe an experiment that was carried out to assess the impact of four variables on ball bond shear strength, and we have thirty observations on each of these variables. So, our response, what we're interested in, in predicting here, is uh, the shear strength of these ball bonds. And then we have uh, we have four variables uh, thrown in here that that we have observations on. So we have um, information on the force, uh, the power, the temperature, and the time that that all went into this experiment. And we're going to try to predict the the shear strength based on these based on these four variables. Um, so I don't think I put this in here, but so then so then the model we're going to fit here is uh, y equals beta zero plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 plus our error. So we're just doing, we're not doing any interactions or quadratic things or anything like that. We're just putting all these variables in there as they are and um, see how good of a model that gives us. Okay, so I can, uh, yeah, I can put this into jump and I can get out my, my parameter estimates here. This table looks uh, the same, but now bigger than what we've seen before. Before there was just an intercept and one one uh, estimate there. Um, so again, you can kind of I think you kind of know what we're looking at here. So my intercept beta zero, my estimated intercept is that first estimate there, negative thirty seven point four seven um, beta hat one. That's the um, coefficient for the force variable. So that's point two one two. Beta three hats. The coefficient for my power vari uh, explanatory variable is 0.49. Um, that's beta two, I guess, isn't it? <laughs> and we could uh, again beta beta three hat and beta four hat are then uh, in that first column as well. Um, so here are our parameter estimates. Um, and again, let's just kind of practice interpreting beta hat one. Uh, which was 0.2116667, I guess, there. So again, just remembering how to interpret each of these uh, um, coefficient estimates. Sa similar as before, so what, what we'll say here is that we estimate um, that the shear strength on the ball bond, so that's our, that's our y variable, um, Changes on average um, by 0.212 grams 
uh, when the force so that's our that's our x1 variable um, increases by one gram okay so we're just saying again beta 1 is just the slope in the x1 direction um, so we're just saying that our response will change by 0 0.212, uh, 0 0.212 when we increase x1 by one unit again this is uh, when everything else is held constant so when the other three predictors are held constant. Okay, so the ter interpretations are, are sort of the same as, as we've seen before. <clears throat> um, and so then we can also write down what our estimated regression equation is. Um, so we said what our model was before, but now our estimated regression equation, again, that before this was y hat equals beta zero hat plus beta 1 hat x and now we're just gonna extend that so um, write down our our uh, parameter estimates here so um, beta 0 hat was 37.48 plus 0.212 x1 plus 0.4983 x2 plus 0.130 x3 plus 0.258 x4 okay so just plugging in my plugging in my parameter estimates uh, into my um, into the model that we that we specified before okay so um, so I don't have to write all that out again the next on the next slide we want to we want to predict the shear strength that results from a certain combination of these predictor variables. So if my, if my force is 35 grams, power is 75 uh, milliwatts, temperature is 200 degrees, and time is 20 milliseconds, uh, what is my predicted shear strength? Well, I can just, um, I can just plug those in. So my predicted shear strength, uh, negative 37.48 plus 0 0.212, so when the uh, force is 35 grams, uh, when the power is 75, <clears throat> the temperature is so 0 0.130, the temperature is 200, and the time is 20 milliseconds, so 0 0.258 times 20. So my prediction for the shear strength under that combination of all of my predictor variables is uh, 38.41 grams. <clears throat> okay, so we can, again, we're doing the same thing that we've done before. We're just, if I want to estimate or predict why based on a certain combination of my predictor variables, I just plug, that, plug those values into my estimated regression equation to get my prediction there. Okay. This all making sense so far? What, what, how we're extending this? So far, okay. All right. <clears throat> so uh, keep talking about all the same things that we've already talked about, just in this in this new setting. Um, so uh, we're going to calculate. So yeah. So in general, our, our predicted or fitted values, the residuals and the sum of squares, are all calculated exactly as they were before. So again, there's kind of nothing new to say about this. Um, so the, the fitted values again are our, those are our, that's our y hat, which again is beta 0 hat plus beta 1 x1 um, plus all the way out to beta hat k xk. Those are my, those are my fitted values. And then the residuals again, uh, which we'll call um, I guess we use subscript J here. Again, this is observed minus expected, or observed minus predicted. So this will be YJ minus Y hat J. So our residuals are still still exactly the same, just our fitted values have a, a more complicated form there. 
And so then we'll calculate our, our uh, error sum of squares, regression sum of squares, and total sum of squares, exactly the same as we did before, nothing new there. Um, but now our degrees of freedom will change because we have more um, predictor variables in our regression equation. Uh, the, sum, the sum of squares for error now has um, fewer degrees of freedom. So we're subtracting off um, k is the number of predictors that we have. And we have, so there's a beta zero in there too, so we have k plus one things we're estimating, so we have to take away k plus one degrees of freedom. Um, so again, in simple linear regression, again, k was equal to one. So n minus k minus one was just n minus two, which is, again, the degrees of freedom that our error had then. So um, again, this is just a more general case of what we've, what we've already seen here before. Okay, so this is uh, R squared is going to be a little bit more useful here now in, in this case, um, which I'll, I'll say in a second here. So, so the, again, R squared is going to be calculated in exactly the same way. We'll take our uh, regression sum of squares divided by our total sum of squares, or 1 minus the, the error sum of squares over the total sum of squares. And why, again, why is that? So what is my total sum of squares equal in terms of my other sum of squares? So what is SST in terms of SS, uh, E and SSR? Yeah, so remember the sum of squares are, are additive. So the total sum of squares is just the sum of those uh, error and regression sum of squares. Okay, so still, still R squared, the interpretation of R squared is exactly the same. So we're still explaining the proportion of variation in our observed Y values um, or so. So R squared is the proportion of variation um, that can be explained by now our multiple regression model. So instead of our simple linear model, we're doing a, our multiple regression model. Um, R squared is no longer the square of our correlation coefficient, um, and that's I put a duh there. That's because we now have more than one. We now have more than one predictor variable. So there's again correlation before was between y and x1, uh, but now we have more predictor variables in there. So that doesn't um, Sort of that idea doesn't translate. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, so we're going to use we're going to use R squared in the same way. Um, and uh, again, it's slightly more useful in this case because uh, once you get to more than three dimensions, you can no longer look. I mean, even three dimensions is kind of hard. Um, but once you get past that, there's no way to look at sort of a scatter plot of of all your data. So so far we've um, back in chapter 12, we talked about scatter plots of predictor versus uh, your explanatory versus the response, and you could kind of see what the relationship was there. Um, if you add in a second predictor variable, now you'd have like a three-dimensional scatter plot, which is sometimes hard to visualize. If you add a third, well, you can no longer look at that. So um, it's harder to visually see what the relationship between several variables together with a response is. Um, and so R squared will sort of be sort of our helpful tool in saying, is there, is there a linear relationship between all of these variables and our response? Um, so, so that's going to be helpful. But there, there is a small problem with R squared. And what that is, um, is that, that R squared can only increase uh, as k increases. So um, at k, again, is the number of explanatory variables we have. So so as I add in more explanatory variables, um, r squared is only going to increase. And this is true even if, even if the predictor variables have no relationship with your response variable. So um, in sort of the most extreme case, if you have n observations, if you have n minus 1 predictors, uh, your r squared is going to be 1. So again, r squared is between 0 and 1. Um, but if you keep adding in more and more predictors, then uh, your r squared will eventually get to 1. Um, 
So that's that's a that's a problem. Uh, we want we want R squared to tell us if there's a useful linear relationship uh, between a bunch of variables and y, and we want to be able to sort of parse out um, when we have too many variables in there, for example. Uh, so there's this alternative diagnostic that we can use, um, sort of going with this goal that we want to explain as much of the variability in our y variable with sort of as simple a model as possible. So simple for, for these models, simple is always better if, if that works. Um, so what we'll have is this adjusted r squared, um, or you might see it called r squared with an a in the subscript. And the formula for this here, <clears throat> um, I r squared adjusted is just um, let's see one minus the error sum of squares uh, divided by just degrees of freedom over the total sum of squares divided by its uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, so again, this is just sort of sort of a, a way to adjust R squared to introduce a penalty for including excessive predictor variables. So as um, if we start to add too many predictor variables in there, uh, this adjusted R squared will will penalize us for that. Um, so this is maybe a more a more accurate diagnostic for when looking for for saying if the model is useful when you have um, lots of predictor variables in there. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll look at um, look at an R squared here in a little bit, um, but let me quick talk about the the error variance sigma squared. Um, so we'll still use we'll still use the error sum of squares as our basis for for estimating the the sigma squared parameter. Um, again, before we well same setup here. So before we took the error sum of squares divided by n minus two because that was the degrees of freedom for those error sum of squares and now we're dividing by n minus k minus 1. Um, so we're still using sort of some sort of a mean squared error for s estimating what this um, variance here is. Okay, questions or comments? Sort of powering through this. <laughs> okay. I'm going to jump ahead skip I'm going to skip the rest of the I'm going to skip the next page I think and and we'll come back to that if we have if we have time. Um and then let's t quick talk quickly talk about assessing model adequacy. So this is the top of the next page there. Um so again kind of going through the same things that we did for our simple linear regression. Uh we also we always want to make sure that our model is appropriate or um is adequate that our modeling assumptions are okay. And to do that, we'll again look at the same types of plots as we did before. We'll look at our residual plots, um, residuals versus either our predicted y's or our or our x's. Uh, we can plot our predictions y hat against the against the observed values, the y i's, and we'll also look at a normal probability plot for those standardized residuals. Um, we're going to look for the same signs of of a bad relationship between these between these variables. So, is there something nonlinear? Is there non-constant variance? Um, are the errors non-normal or something like that? Um, so we're going to look look for the same the same types of things as we did before. So going back to our our shear strength example, um, maybe I don't know if you can see that very well on the on the picture, but look in your notes if you can't. So here I have a um, on the left side here I have a uh, fitted y versus actual y, so y hat versus uh, y. On the right side there, I have my residual plot against the predicted values, um, and then also I've in your notes there is a is a normal probability plot. Very hard to see in that printout, I guess. <laughs> Sorry about that. Those points are very small. Okay, but so so keeping an eye on those on those plots, let's uh, let's comment on the fit of this model, or, or how, or talk about our assumptions for this model. Um, so looking at those three plots again, we're looking for the exact same things as we've looked looked for before. So let's practice doing that. What what do you guys think? Looking at those residual plots and um, the normal probability plots, how how's our model doing?
So what about this first? What about this first plot here? What about the? And again, maybe you're better off looking in your notes. I'm not sure. What do we want to see in that uh, y hat versus y plot? Just sort of regardless of what's going on here, what do we want to see? If our model is good, yeah, we want to see our points sort of clustered around that red line in the middle, around that 45 degree line. Um, so, if you can see that, what do you what do you think? Yeah, there are, there are some points outside this area. It's true, and there's and there's sort of no points up there. Um, I don't know. Again, again, it's not it's not going to be perfect. We just want to. Oh yeah, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so so the comment was it it maybe looks sort of like a pretty pretty good fit. Um, again, it's maybe not going to be perfect, but but again, there's nothing sort of really extreme going on here that would would alert you that maybe this is a that that the the model is is bad or I've I've chosen the wrong predictor variables or something like that. Um, so I would say that actual versus predicted plot is looking is looking pretty good. What about my residual plot? That one's a little easier to see. What do I want to see in a residual plot if my model is good? I want to see nothing, right? I want to see random random scatter. So what do you think about that residual plot? It looks good. Looks yeah, looks great, right? This, I don't I don't see any I don't see any patterns in there. And then a uh, normal probability plot, what am I looking for there? Again, 45 degree line, right? Yeah, so um, again it's not perfect, but again looks looks pretty good. Um, so I would say the uh, Fitted versus actual um, is looking pretty good. Um, the residual plot, I would say that looks very good. <clears throat> and the the normal probability plot also looks very good. So what that tells me is that that I that the model has been specified correctly. I would say um, as long as these these plots are all checking out, so um, at least the the assumptions that I made in fitting this model are all are all good. So um, so therefore, in specifying this model. These are they're all they're all appropriate or safe in some some way. So because again, remember before we were checking conditions, uh, now sort of our way to assess the modeling assumptions are to look at these plots. And so um, when these plots all look good, that that sort of ensures you that your modeling assumptions are okay, and that was that this was a a good model to fit to the data. Okay. Questions, comments? All good. Okay, so all that's kind of kind of exploratory stuff as as far as getting estimates and interpreting them and kind of looking at the various information that we have. Um, but again, the more the more interesting thing here is to is to say is this model good? Is this or how how do I decide which model to choose? And so we'll we'll get into that now and thinking about sort of inference and. Um, hypothesis testing just like we did before. Okay, so, so before, um, in chapter 12, we did our, did our model utility test to tell us if the, if the model is useful. So our assumptions tell us that looking at the plots tell us if the, if the linear model is appropriate. So that's, that's one question. But then the other question to ask is, is, is this model useful or is it, is it good? Um, and by, by useful, I mean, does it explain this variability in my response variable uh, for my predictors? Um, so we can do the same. We can do the same type of test that we did in Chapter 12 here. Uh, this is our model utility test. So, um, sort of, is there a useful linear relationship? Was the question we asked then? Um, before our model utility test involved a null hypothesis, hypothesis that looked something like um, beta one was equal to zero. So now, now the sort of corresponding assertion here is that our null hypothesis is that all our predictor, all the coefficients for our predictor variables. Are equal to zero. 
So that would kind of again say that there is there's no linear relationship between any of my predictor variables and my response variable. If all those coefficients were zero, um, then the form of your model sort of goes away and it's just that, just that intercept term. Um, so this is kind of the same as saying the expected value of my y's is just equal to beta zero, um, right? It's still kind of that, if all my coefficients are zero, then, then I don't have anything in my model there. So the alternative is going to be, um, I think I, oh, I, I, have, I have that written down on, on the next slide. So uh, this is what our null hypothesis is going to be. And again, what that, what that says is that there's, again, there's no useful relationship between the response and any of the predictive variables. Yeah, Jamie. Yeah. I mean, you would have had to like pick multiple variables that had nothing to do with what you were trying to. Yeah. All right. So the comment was, wouldn't you have to have a really terrible model for, for you to fail to reject in some sense here? So for you to say that the null hypothesis is true, and yeah, yeah, that that's. It seems like extreme. Yeah. Yeah. So it it does seem sort of extreme, but it but it can certainly happen. So it's it's kind of like our first check. We want to make sure. Is this thing doing doing anything useful? So, um, yeah, most of the time you will reject the null hypothesis here, but um, it's just sort of a good first check to say, um, is this have I have I specified something that's interesting here? Yeah, and we'll get so and then we'll get into testing individual coefficients. That's our that's our sort of next step. So first we'll say overall, is there any useful linear information in this in, uh, among these explanatory variables? And then we can go on to say, well, which ones specifically are and which ones are not. So that's kind of our, that's kind of our next step. Um, yeah, so the null is what we said. The alternative is, is again, sort of a very unlikely case that, that at least one, or, or sort of very likely case, that at least one of our betas is not, not equal to zero. So we're, again, we're not saying which one is non-zero. We're just saying that at least one of them is non-zero. That's sort of the opposite of the null hypothesis there. Um, test statistic, exactly the same as well as before. Mean squared for regression over mean squared error. Um, the degrees of freedom are, are different now, so they're, what you're dividing by is slightly different. Uh, P-value is the same as before. Probability, it's uh, still an F random variable. And we'll again use technology to look at these, to look at these P-values. Um, so looking at our, going back to our example here, here's the ANOVA table with our sum of squares and mean squares and all that. Um, so if, if we want to conduct a model utility test to say, is this, is this thing any good? Um, our hypotheses, again, will be the null is that beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4 are all 0, whereas the alternative is that at least, at least one beta, uh, one of those betas is not, is not equal to 0. For i equals 1, 4. Okay. So again, uh, again, the ANOVA table gives you gives you all the information that you need, right? Uh, it has our sum of squares, but and it has our degrees of freedom and our sum of squares, which again you can see add up just like they did before. the The total row is the sum of the two above it. Um, the mean square column is simply the sum of squares column divided by degrees of freedom. You can check that. And then the F ratio is just uh, mean squared for regression, so 415 over over 26. Um, so the everything's already given to you again, which is nice. So my test statistic here is um, again 15.6 from the table, and my p-value then is uh, what does that say? So here's my here's my p-value. So it's less than 0 0.0001. Okay, so what's my conclusion going to be? Not surprisingly. Do I want to reject or fail to reject? Yeah, so I'm going to reject the null hypothesis because the p-value is very small. And again, so what that means here is that um, what we conclude is that um, that at least that at least one of our betas here is not zero, which means that there, 
that there is a significant linear relationship um, between our between our y and at least one of the x variables. Okay, so again, we're not saying uh, so far. We're not saying which which uh, predictive variable has a significant linear relationship. We're just saying that at least at least one of them does. So this is kind of our first check to see is this model even worth even worth looking at to start with. Okay, <laughs> start moving a little more quickly here. I want to get to a final example. Um, so so as, as as Jamie's question sort of got at. Um, that's maybe not usually going to tell you all that much information. It's going to kind of be a first check to say, is this, is this something worth doing? Um, but so after we've done that and said that, yes, there is at least one of them, then we can move on to our individual betas and say which one of those are significant versus, versus not significant. Um, and so I can do a confidence interval in exactly the same way as I did before. Uh, my standard errors are going to be, again, from the regression output, which I'll look at in just a second here. Um, and I can also do a, a hypothesis test. Um, again, exactly the same way as I did before. And uh, you'll calculate your p-values depending on whether you have a greater than, less than, or not equal to in your alternative. Again, so no nothing new here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, sort of just to quickly say what our, our interpretation is uh, for this, for a hypothesis test of this type. Um, I'm not going to write it down. I'll, I'll post the completed notes. But again, we're, we're, our inference is all going to be conditional inference based on what else is in our model. So if, I, if I'm testing, let's say I'm testing beta 1 and I get a significant result, then I would say beta 1 is significantly non-zero or something like that, given that everything else is in the model. So um, it's, these, it's these sort of conditional statements based on, based on the model that you specified. Is a predictor variable useful? Um, is kind of the questions that we're going to answer here. Okay, so so back to our example here. Here's our parameter estimates again, um, out of jump. And again, if you wanted to do a confidence interval, here's your S of beta hat J. So the standard error is the same same place that it was before. Um, but as as we saw before, we're most often interested in testing um, something like. Um, if a single parameter is equal to zero versus the alternative that it is not equal to zero. Okay, so yeah, so again, the table gives us our standard errors, which is the, uh, that's the S sub beta hat J. And it also gives you the, the T ratio And that would be your estimate divided by the standard error. You can kind of check that that's, that that's there. And it also gives you the, this thing here is your, is your p-value for um, the alternative that beta j is not. So that's your two-tailed two p-value there. Um, so we're, we're quickly able to look at this output and uh, and determine sort of which which predictor variables are significant, right? So which, um, again, kind of glossing over all the formal steps of writing out a hypothesis and doing the test, just looking at p-values, uh, which predictor variables are are sort of useful in this model and which which ones are not. Yeah. So power. And temperature both have very small p-values. So for power and temperature, you would you would reject the null hypothesis, right? So for um, for these, you would you would reject the null hypothesis because your p-value is very small. Whereas those other two are not really not really saying they don't really have any useful relationship here, right? So um, for force, because the p-value is large you would fail to reject the null hypothesis and same with same with time again your remember your p value is 
uh, you're testing this these hypotheses here that you're that these uh, coefficients are not equal to zero. So a small small uh, a large p-value means that the alternative hypothesis is probably not true, and that that coefficient maybe really is equal to zero. And sort of again that that means that there is sort of no useful linear relationship between between those predictor variables and the response, while um, power and temperature do have a very significant linear relationship with our response variable. So would you take that data and then uh, say, I'm going to throw out about uh, force and time and rerun the statistics and say this is a better model? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is get to a, a, a good model for a system. Yes, yeah, right. So. So the, the again the, the comment was so then would we not would we not sort of like throw out force and time and rerun this model because are we not trying to get a good model for predicting um, for predicting our shear strength um, that would be one option yeah I mean you you could do that um, and that that would certainly accomplish the goal of having a simpler model to give you something that's almost as, as good, that has almost the same sort of predictive strength as, as this model. Um, yeah, that and, that and that's probably what I would do, is probably like throw out those variables, run the model again, and then sort of have a simpler equation to use to estimate the shear strength there. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but again, we're kind of going through all this in case, in case you're interested in, a, in the question of something like, is there a useful relationship, is there a linear relationship between force and my shear strength um, in a model like this. Uh, so if, if you're interested in the, in the individual relationships between force and, and your shear strength, for example, this kind of uh, helps you see that um, all, all together here. Yeah. OK. Well, I didn't quite get to my final example here, did I? <laughs> Um, maybe I'll just maybe I'll just show this to you real quick. This is sort of an extension of uh, of the um, Cleveland Cavs example that we saw before. So I don't know. Uh, again, kind of this this trend of doing analytics in in sports data is really really popular now. Um, so kind of going back to this the same data set, we can we can uh, fit a model, and I think I think I only have. Uh, 31 of these. I think I forgot to make that change. Um, but what, what, I, what I have there in your notes is I fit a just a simple model with, with first order, so no interactions, no quadratic terms, nothing like that, um, where I'm trying to predict wins based on, uh, based on a bunch of variables. Um, so I think those, those are the variables that I'm interested in looking at here. And Again, let's uh, let's just real quick review what we just talked about. So here here's the here's the output. So um, I'm trying to predict wins based on all of these all of these variables. So looking looking first up here, sort of our first check. Overall, is the model useful in, in helping to helping us to predict wins? So is there a useful linear relationship between any of our variables and the response here? Um, yeah, your your p value is is pretty small, right? So that that tells us that. Um, that's our overall model test that says at least one of the variables has a relationship with with uh, predicting wins. Um, and so now, if I throw all of these all of these variables in here, just kind of quickly looking at the parameter estimates and um, specifically the final column, um, which variables sort of given that everything is in this model, which variables are useful in helping us to know what what made the calves successful? So which, which variables have a useful linear relationship with, with wins um, in this model? Yep, so we have field goal percentage. Looks like free throw percentage is also going to be pretty good. Uh, steals and turnovers are all are both looking important as well. And some of those other variables, not so much. Okay, so um, I'm out of time. But uh, again, if, if you were a sports statistician working with the Cavs and they were like, uh, so what, what, what should we try to improve in our team to help us, help us have more wins or make us a better team? You could come back and say, well, you should, you should get players that uh, have good field goal shooting, good free throw shooting, um, 
have good steals and good turnovers as well. So th this is a way to kind of pick out things that have, have been useful for the Cavs' success in the past. Um, so sorry that was such a rush job. Um, thank you guys for being here. Have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday. <clears throat> yes, sir. Stop this real quick. Oh, and I do have your homework sevens to uh, get backs.